Hi everyone. If your map is wrong, you're going to have a hard time navigating. If your map looks like this, <laughs> you're screwed. The shortest path between two points on a plane is a straight line. The shortest path between two points on the surface of a sphere is a great circle arc. On the flat earth, as long as we're close to the north pole, straight lines will match great circle arcs pretty well. But as you go south, well, you're screwed. Let's say we want to fly from LA to Sydney, Australia. Naturally, we'll strive to use the shortest possible distance to save time and fuel. This means we'll leave LA heading northwest. On a spheroidal Earth, however, you would head southwest and follow a great circle arc. That's right, this path is much shorter than this one. Because the Earth isn't flat and this map is garbage. Now, of course, flatties will say that the real flight path between LA and Sydney is the one they propose, but nope, sorry. This is the actual flight path used by a commercial airline. Indeed, the plane heads southwest, traveling a distance of 7,503 miles, which takes 14 hours and 9 minutes. That's about three times the width of the US, so the travel time makes perfect sense as it takes 4 hours and 49 minutes to fly from LA to New York. On that note, this is also almost exactly the time it takes to fly between Sydney and Perth. That's interesting since on the flat Earth, Australia is almost twice as wide as the US. A common claim by flat Earthers is that there are no commercial flights between South Africa and Australia. If you want to make that trip, you have to stop over in Dubai or something like that, which of course would make sense on a flat Earth. But of course, as always, the flatties are wrong. Not only are there direct flights between Johannesburg and Sydney, they only take 13 hours and 30 minutes. That's less than it takes to travel from LA to Sydney, which of course makes perfect sense on a spheroidal Earth. The distance is a bit shorter, 6,857 miles. Yes, these points are actually closer than these. Similarly, there's a flight between Sydney and Santiago, Chile. What's interesting about this one is that it clearly passes south of New Zealand, which again makes perfect sense on a spheroidal Earth. The travel time, 12 hours and 36 minutes, also makes sense, but on a flat Earth, it would have to take about twice as long as the flight from LA to Sydney. Feel free to check the travel times and distances for yourself using flightaware.com. Then go try to book tickets for the flight in question by going to the airline's website. You don't have to actually order anything, just check that yes, these are commercial flights that anyone can take, and these really are the travel times and distances announced. Yeah, I know what the flatties are gonna say, all the airlines are lying, there's a huge conspiracy, blah blah blah. I'm not even gonna address that here, I'll get to it. So here's a thought. Go from Sydney to Johannesburg in 14 hours. Yes, I'm rounding because there are plenty of factors that can affect these numbers. Johannesburg to Sao Paulo, Brazil in 10 hours, from there to Santiago in 3, and from there back to Sydney in 13. In total, that's 40 hours. Let's try something similar on the Northern Hemisphere. Let's start in LA. LA to Tokyo in 11 hours, Tokyo to Shanghai in 2 hours, Shanghai to Moscow in 9 hours, Moscow to London in 4, and London to LA in 10. That's 36 hours, pretty much the same. Now, of course, we'll have to take into account that you might have to wait between flights in reality, but I wonder how Flat Earthers will explain that in principle, these paths take about the same time to travel using the same mode of transportation. Wait, I know this one. La 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 la, the globe is dead, la la la, there's no proof of curvature, stupid globe heads, the Earth is flat, la 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 la. Sure, flatties. Keep telling yourself that. Meanwhile, I'm going to present some more evidence. And this isn't just evidence that the Earth is round, it's also evidence that it rotates. The Coriolis effect. Flat Earthers either don't know what that is, or they once again deny blatantly obvious empirical facts. The Coriolis effect is one of the major factors that determine the paths of winds and currents at large scales. Right. Large scales. Contrary to popular belief, it has nothing to do with how water drains in your toilet. So what is the Coriolis effect? Well, it's an effect that causes moving bodies and rotating frames of reference to accelerate as a result of inertia. I'll explain. 
Consider a disc which rotates counterclockwise. A person stands on that disc and throws a ball in the direction of its center. Now let's let the camera rotate along with the disc. The ball appears to accelerate to the right, even though it's really moving in a straight line. This effect applies to moving objects on Earth as well, since moving north on the northern hemisphere or south on the southern also means moving closer to the Earth's axis. Somewhat counterintuitively, one might think this results in cyclones rotating counterclockwise on the northern hemisphere and clockwise on the southern. This shows that not only does the Earth rotate, the southern hemisphere is indeed upside down compared to the northern one. How do flat earthers explain this? They don't. Instead, they'll say that no such effect can be observed, and will cite the paths of airplanes. Which they clearly know oh so much about. As evidence. Planes don't veer off to the right. No, indeed they don't, and that's because the motion of the plane is relative to the air, which rotates along with the Earth. So all the pilot, or autopilot today more likely, has to do to compensate for the Coriolis effect is keep the nose pointing in the direction he wants to go. However, since winds are affected by the Coriolis effect, and planes are affected by winds, yes, planes are indirectly affected as well. Yes, by the way, I said that the atmosphere rotates along with the Earth. This is because of friction between the atmosphere and the surface, gravity, and most importantly, inertia. Why would it not keep moving? What force would prevent it from following the Earth as it rotates? Just like geocentrists, flatties buy into the Aristotelian theory of motion, if it can even be called a theory, long since disproved by people like Galileo and Newton. Aristotle believed that uniform motion requires continuous application of force. It doesn't. Force is only required to change the speed or direction of motion. That's Newton's first law of mechanics. An object moving at constant velocity, or at rest, will maintain that velocity, or remain at rest, until acted upon by a net force greater than zero. This is also known as the law of inertia. This is why, if you jump out of a moving car, you keep moving until wind resistance and friction against the ground slow you down. Aristotelian physics was based on something quite similar to the reasoning used by flat earthers, actually. Begin by making a very simple observation. If you stop pushing a cart, eventually it stops. Come up with a simple intuitive explanation. Uniform motion requires continuous application of force. And then build on that without even considering that it might be wrong. Present your reasoning to others, and if the logic holds up, then your conclusions must be correct. Galileo was one of, if not the first, to realize that it doesn't matter if the logic holds up if experiments don't support your conclusions. Your reasoning can be spotless, but if your premises don't hold up, or there are factors involved that you don't know about, you can still be wrong. The ultimate judge of a model of reality isn't your peers, common sense, or even logic, but the reality the model attempts to describe. So let's try to sum up everything we've been over up to this point. How well does the Flat Earth model match reality? What predictions does it make? I could keep this list going for quite a while, but my point is this. The one prediction that Flat Earthers get right is the one that's immediately intuitive, and it happens to be the same in both models. Physics as we know it today really began when intuition was challenged, when we understood that intuition is often wrong. It's easy to say that no, intuition is always right, and it's physics that's wrong, but the simple fact of the matter is that intuitive Aristotelian physics didn't bring us anything. Newtonian physics and the modern continuations of it, quantum mechanics and general relativity, brought us pretty much every mechanical invention made in the past 300 years, not to mention the electronic ones. It works. It's useful. That's how the accuracy of a scientific model is measured, by its usefulness. The Flat Earth model has none. Every prediction it makes that sets it apart from the alternative is dead wrong 
and every prediction made by the alternative is correct. We started making real progress in science when we realized that experimental results trump intuition and we abandoned Aristotelian physics. But in another delightful case of irony, at least Aristotle got one thing right about physics. He knew that the Earth wasn't flat. Say it.